This is Bible Academy. Today we continue in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verse 12. Now before we get started, as always, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins, that we are allowing the Spirit of God to control us. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and the privilege and everything you provided so that we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. We continue Jesus' journey to Jerusalem. He has some stops along the way. We've been looking at that one regarding the mission of the 72. Let's look at the translation that we studied last time. Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 11. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was about to go. And he was saying to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whenever you enter a house, first say, Peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking from them, for the labor deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, The kingdom of God has come upon you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town that clings to our feet we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come. Now we've learned that the Kingdom of God, Phase 1, was inaugurated by Jesus and His ministry. Now the disciples are to continue that mission of going out on their own. You might say they're going to go solo, except they go in pairs. And they will experience rejection, both to Jesus' message as well as themselves. But they'll also have some acceptance. And when they find a town that totally rejects them, they leave the town, uh, demonstrate this curse, but there is more coming upon these towns than just that curse at the time. Now in verses 12 through 15, we will see mention of four familiar cities and one called Chorazin. That's unfamiliar, but it's in Galilee. Jesus uses them as sample cities where most of the people have rejected God. Uh, we've heard of Tyre and Sidon. They're well known in the Old Testament, but they're also known for their rejection and judgment. Of course, we've heard of Sodom. It's notorious for its wickedness, and we know about its destruction. So these cities that are in Galilee where Jesus has been ministering, are said to be judged more severely, especially since they had the advantages of the kingdom message. Those Old Testament uh, cities did not. So they're more responsible in rejecting Christ and his message. That is, those cities in Galilee. And that's a contrast Jesus is going to bring up. And that's the main point. Verse 12. 
Jesus continues to speak, I tell you it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Now this is the town that's rejected the message as well as the disciples. Jesus says, I say to you, that's literal, a solemn declaration. This is authorized by God. This is coming from God. That Sodom, of all cities to mention, Sodom was considered one of the most wicked cities mentioned in the Old Testament, we might say, in all of history. Just to give you a brief reminder, the story is in Genesis 19, 1 through 29. So Lot's there in the city. A couple of angels come in to the city to have contact with him. They do. He invites them to their house. They eat, but before they're able to leave, the men of the city, are, uh, the men of the city, surround the house in which they're in, and they're calling for them to come out so they can homosexually gang rape them. The angels struck the men blind, and they all escaped the city before its destruction with Lot's wife and daughters. And then we know of the city being completely destroyed by the Lord. The contrast here is with Sodom of all cities. Let me read the verse again. I tell you it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. This is the town who's rejected the message of Christ and who he was. His work in person. Now you say this is quite a shock. Yes it is. That's the point. Sodom had it easier, more bearable, or tolerable, we could say, than what these towns who outright reject the message of the kingdom of God. They've received more revelation. They all had a prime opportunity to respond to God and the one sent, but refused both Christ's work and person. So as Sodom got wiped out for its sin, then how much more those cities who not only continue in their sin but reject the Messiah and that's what you want to see here now to sum it up both cities are condemned both cities are going to be judged but the point that's brought out here is how much more these cities in Galilee are going to be judged because of the opportunity they passed. Well, the list of those cities begin. Let's start to look at them for a moment. First of all, let's read the verse, then we'll look at a map. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you, which they were not, that's the Greek implication, for if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, setting in sackcloth and ashes. Let's locate the cities for a moment. <clears throat> we can get most of these, at least show them on our map. Now we're familiar with Bethsaida. That's right up here by the Sea of Galilee. Here's Capernaum. It's coming up. Here's Tyre up here and sides up that direction as well. Chorazin's not on the map. I'm not even sure they know where that is. I think they have their suspicions. Um, archaeologists seem to think they find these cities sometimes, and I'm sure they do. But it's, I think, just a couple of miles north of Capernaum, so it's right up here, too. But these are all Galilee cities right here, and they're being compared to Tyre and Sidon, and then Sodom, which at the time was before the people got established in the land. And that would be probably down in the Dead Sea area, way down here. But let's just talk about these cities we have mentioned right here. Verse 13 again. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Both of these cities, understand, are in Galilee. This is where Jesus, Jesus had just finished his ministry. As a whole, both of these cities rejected the message. They rejected Jesus. The word woe is a word that signifies grief, either 
one is going through grief, or in this case, it's a denunciation, and they're going to suffer some grief. Woe is what they're going to say because they are cursed for their rejection of the gospel. Why? Well, I said for the rejection of the gospel. Look at the scripture. For if the mighty works done in you, which they were not, that's in the Greek, had been done in Tyre and Sidon. This is a second class condition. If and it did not. For if and it did not. The mighty works. The word is dunamis. The word for power. We've seen it many times. Uh, we think of the word dynamite. Dunamis. Let me get it up here in some of the words to define it. Dunamis. Power, strength. Here it's powerful works or miracles. Bringing the gospel message with the power of the Spirit. That's what happened here. Now, they had been done in these, had they been done in these cities, what Jesus is saying is they repented. So what this is saying is that the Gentile cities had a much greater advantage and they didn't repent than these I said Gentile, I should have said Galilee cities, than those cities that were Gentile cities that did not get the miracles. And Jesus said if they got the miracles like you got, they'd repented. But we got to understand also that their hearts weren't ready either. So they didn't get that privilege. It wasn't that time in God's history, but they're both negative cities. That's what it amounts to. But the point is that Jesus is making a comparison. He's showing the advantage these people had here in Galilee, and they're still turning it down. Now, Tyre and Sidon are both known for being uh, pagan cities that came under judgment. A few verses on that. Amos 1, 9 and following. Isaiah 23, 1 through 18. Jeremiah 25, 22, 47, 4. Well, that's enough. There, there are others. Back to our verse, Luke ten thirteen. The end of it, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. Now, of course, sackcloth and ashes is basically a sackcloth is self-imposed misery. You get something, um, the goat's hair or something, and wear it so it scratches your back, reminding you of uh, how bad you are, how bad... You need to turn to God, and it's a sign of repentance. Ashes, that's exactly what it is. Ashes, they put ashes on their head to, to show they're in mourning. So what this is saying is that Chorazin and Bethsaida are cursed for their rejection of the gospel. They had plenty of opportunities to respond to the gospel if those same miracles had, be done, had been done and those Gentile cities of Tyre and Sidon. Because Tyre and Sidon would have repented. Though negative, they were not as negative or hardened as these Gentile cities. That's the point. All right? So this is saying that Chorazin and Bethsaida had plenty of opportunities to respond to the gospel. And if those same miracles had been done in these Gentile cities like Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented. Now, all of them are negative. But Gentiles' cities were the most. That's the point. Now, this is for argument's sake and in comparison to show how hard these cities were. And don't miss the point. The point is that these current Jewish cities should be ashamed. Their hardness to truth is epic. So this verse shows how hardened these two cities in Galilee were, and more so than a couple of Old Testament Gentile cities who were known for their judgment. Verse 14, regarding their judgment. 
but it will be more bearable in the judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. Now this must have woken them up. It would have woken them up had they heard this. But Jesus is teaching principle here to his disciples. For Tyre and Sidon were known for their sins against God and their judgment. And if, and if they were condemned, how much more these cities in Galilee that outright rejected the gospel. Now you're telling disciples, Jesus is telling disciples that have experienced rejection. So it's not unusual. Jesus experienced a lot of rejection, a lot more rejection than he did acceptance. Something that those of you in ministry can look forward to. So many ministers get closed up in their pastorate and hardly go outside their church or have little contact with those outside it. But if they did, they would probably find themselves rejected constantly. Again, another way of saying these old, unrepented Gentile sinners would be better off in the judgment than the current Jewish cities in Galilee. The same is true as Capernaum, verse 15. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? No. You should be brought down to Hades. Remember that Jesus had been to Capernaum where they witnessed him and his power, Luke 4, 23. Here he raises the question, will you be exalted to heaven? The Greek structure again expects a no answer. Did the people of Capernaum really expect to be raised to heaven just because Jesus had been there or done miracles or some other reason? But they're going to go the opposite way. You shall be brought down to Hades. Hades is the Greek word for the Hebrew Sheol, the place of the dead, the grave, and beyond. More specifically here, it is where those who reject the gospel will go. So all these Jewish cities who have heard the gospel, seen the miracles, even through Jesus himself, should have no expectations except Hades. Final word of instruction. The one who hears you hears me, and the one who rejects you rejects me, and the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. Now remember, Jesus is instructing these 72. This tells them how much Jesus is with them in their message. Hearing here is used in the sense of hearing and obeying. Rejection is rejection, including rejecting the disciples. As this verse sums up, and they reject the disciples, they reject Jesus, they reject Jesus, they reject the one who sent him, they reject the Father. Now, on the one hand, that would be encouraging to the disciples to know that God the Son and God the Father was with them. But the reality of the fact is, many times all will be rejected. Let's sum this up in four points. First, Jesus connects what he says and who he is with what the disciples say and who they are. Second, the one who hears and accepts or rejects Jesus also hears and accepts or rejects the disciples. Third, those who reject Jesus also reject the one who sent him, God the Father. So it's a matter of choice. So again, Jesus puts the disciples and himself together in ministry. They are acting on his behalf as well as the Father's. They are treated the way they would treat Jesus and demonstrate what they think of God. I think one of the things worth reflecting on for a moment is how much rejection Jesus had to face. Uh, the perfect man, the God-man, without sin, he never did the wrong thing. He always said the right thing. And yet he was constantly rejected 
by the masses. Well, the good thing is, again, that Jesus is in this with the disciples. And that's something for us to keep in mind as well. He's with us in our ministry, in our service. As we stay in line with him and the Father and their plan and what we're to do, we do that through learning the word and being obedient. So God is with us in this. Jesus is with us. A good thing to remember when you do your ministry. So this verse is another conclusion from those who reject the gospel of the kingdom. That's the emphasis here. So the 72 go out. They do their mission. They cover some ground. Perhaps Jesus is already going to some of those towns as they have already preceded him. And they eventually come back and report to him. That begins in verses 17 and verse 17 and continues through verse 20. Let's look at the report. The 72 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Well, the disciples have had quite the experience in doing the miracles, including casting out demons. They're joyful and excited to say the, the least, uh, say the, say that uh, they had experienced these things. Uh, they say why it's been so exciting. The thing that's on their mind is the demons, that they had cast out demons. They begin by saying, Lord, Kurios, Master, the one with authority. So the first thing that disciples tell the Lord is that even the demons are subject to us in your name. Don't miss that. Though they had done many miracles, including healing, it is the casting out of demons that was the most impressive. Now there are those today who claim to cast out demons. And they say they do it in the Lord's name. I have very serious doubts about that. I don't think they really are. But I just have one question. If you can really cast out demons, and that is the greater th miracle, then why aren't you doing the lesser miracle and going to the hospitals and healing people left and right? And I can imagine their arguments are going to be like, well, we're not given that particular gift. Other people have that gift really, then where are they emptying out the hospitals? You see, don't fall for that stuff. And if you're a Christian, please don't get involved. You're going to find yourself completely, uh, well, that's what I can think of right now is propagandized by them, fooled, thinking that's what you're doing. Now here, Jesus has given the disciples the authority and power to do so. By them doing it, they say, in your name, that's a recognition that the disciples clearly understand it's by God's authority and his power this is happening, not theirs. It was by that power and authority that Jesus gave them. But the disciples did get to experience God's power through these miracles while acting on behalf of Jesus. Now how exciting that must have been for them to have that kind of control over demons. Now, had we lived in those days, we would probably understand this more, but to see people tormented by demons all their life, and then these disciples able to go up there and cast these demons out that had been perhaps torturing this human, including whatever family members had to deal with that, must have been a wonderful thing. But healings and casting out of demons were all part of the same group of miraculous powers Jesus gave them. In verse 18, Jesus responds to their words regarding their casting out demons. Interesting response. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now Jesus said, I saw. 
That's in the past. You could call it English past tense. Now the question is whether Jesus was talking about his experience as the pre-incarnate Christ, as God the Son in heaven, when this took place in the far distant past, or did he just have a vision and see it in the sense of what is going on when these demonic powers are defeated? We have no way to know for sure. There's no indicators in this passage to tell us. Uh, but we know Satan fell. We know that as Jesus came on the scene and he manifested his control over demons and now has passed on the disciples for a while that the demonic forces uh, are being defeated. But this saying of Jesus is a reminder of the continuing decline of Satan and his power. As things do get intense during these final days, his end is coming. Demonstrated every day as saints walk the earth in the power of the Spirit accomplishing God's will. Every day you walk with the Lord in fellowship, control the Spirit, you demonstrate the supreme power of God over satanic power. It's not to say that you won't get attacked now and then by Satan or his demons. But I suppose it's a rare thing. And if it does, certainly God is there to protect you, defend you, and get them out of the area. That's usually the routine. Now, we just saw this mention of Satan's fall. How about a short reminder? This is in detail in the falls of Satan. But let me just read through a brief review of the falls of Satan, his history, as well as his future. In the past, the first fall of Satan was when he rebelled against God and was demoted from being the highest ranking angel to becoming the highest ranking demon. That centers around Isaiah 14, 12. When he was demoted, Satan's power and authority was significantly, significantly diminished. He had been kicked out of the Lord's host his army, and then he took charge of his own army of traitors against the Most High. With this demotion, Satan moves his operation to earth to control the world through his cosmos diabolicus. But now Jesus has come onto the scene some 2,000 years ago with his kingdom power. Kingdom power has arrived, and Satan is starting to experience further falling as his power is gradually overwhelmed. So now in the present, this period which began with Jesus' first coming, his power continues to diminish, so much so that even secondary agents like disciples in Jesus' name can command the demons when authorized by Jesus. And I might remind you folks, we're in this same era. We call it phase two, kingdom of God. Now Satan's future, his final demise, will come in two stages. First, he's confined to prison during the millennial kingdom of God on earth, phase two. And then he's released for a short time, and then for all eternity he will be condemned to the lake of fire. That's the beginning of phase three, kingdom of God goes into eternity. As Satan goes into eternal lake of fire. John 12, 31, compared with Revelation 20, 10. Here Jesus compares his fall to lightning. Notice coming down from heaven to the earth. Lightning is seen as coming down from the heavens. It's quick, it's dramatic. This is the most obvious observation. So Jesus saw Satan falling as his disciples are out there working miracles, including casting out demons. 
Verse 19 refers to the authority Jesus gives these disciples. They're not done. Verse 19. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Well, we think of serpents and scorpions. We think of something on the ground. Perhaps something we'll step on, something that snakes up on us, that surprises us. Now, Jesus says, I've given you authority. That is, these disciples and this mission specifically, their mission at that time in history, during that time period. This continues on until the apostolic age is over. That is, the end of the first century church. They are given authority to tread. Let's talk about tread for a moment. You've probably seen that flag, don't tread on me if you're in the United States. It's a familiar flag for, for those who are familiar with the patriot movement. Tread is pateo, tread, trample, walk on. Therefore, it's crushing and destroying. Obviously, if you walk on top of a snake, uh, assuming you crush it, step it on the head, step on its head, or a scorpion. It says on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy shall not hurt you. Get the verse back up there for you. Let's talk about this. To tread on has the sense of smashing like grapes in a wine press revelation 1915 to tread on to destroy to abuse that's what happens with the temple revelation 1112 in jerusalem luke 2124 so our use here is to walk on or crush, smash, snakes and scorpions. In other words, they die, you don't. They're injured, you're not. They represent the hostility of nature. God will protect the disciples from the hostility of nature even through miraculous means to continue to show they are from God by exercising the authority that God has given them. I'll read that again. God will protect the disciples from the hostility of nature even through miraculous means to continue to show they are from God by exercising the authority that God has given them. It goes on to say, and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. The enemy here would be demonic forces as well. And nothing will hurt you. So for now, God has given these disciples authority over the hostility of nature and demonic forces. This includes performing the miraculous that continues to show people they are from God and they need to listen to their message. That was the purpose of the sign miracles. Now the concept of this authority over nature and Satan reminds us of Genesis where Satan usurped the authority over the world from man. Nature became hostile to the curse of the ground, which became a burden for man to contend with. But as the kingdom of God breaks in with this new age, so does this include authority and protection from the hostility of nature and demonic forces. I think many of us don't think about this, but we are in a very special time. A new era inaugurated by Jesus. These disciples will experience power over both nature and demonic forces. And this is especially manifest in the early days of the church to demonstrate that the kingdom of God had arrived with its power. So we read of things like the exorcism of demons. And, uh, there's a story, of course, in, towards the end of Acts where Paul is latched onto by a deadly viper and he grabs it and tosses it off. 
was actually bit by it. Acts 28, 3 through 6. So we see that in these early missionaries during this first century, the disciples were protected in miraculous ways. You might ask, but what about today? Do we have any business handling snakes as some Christians have claimed to be able to do? Well, God still protects disciples today, you and me. But not through uh, the use of miraculous powers by the believers. We use prayer and depend on the sovereignty of God. We understand the unseen protection goes on all the time. I think the biggest danger to my family members is constantly having to drive on the freeway. Almost every day we hear ambulances drive down to help someone that's been in a car accident on the freeway. We don't live too far from the freeway. But doing these miracles is not the biggest thing that has happened to the disciples. After all that said about that, how wonderful and great it was, listen to verse 20, Luke 10, 20. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject, subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. First line, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you. Now, this is a great thing, what they've been able to do. It's the one they're so thrilled about, and they see the power of God over the power of Satan and his demonic forces. But it's not the greatest thing to rejoice in. This isn't saying they shouldn't rejoice at all. But in comparing that with their names being written in heaven, that's much greater. The most important thing is that this command here to rejoice. Present imperative, continue to rejoice that your names are written. Perfect, passive, indicative. Already written. They're already there. They're on the roster. They're on the heavenly census, you might say, in heaven. Now this, of course, is the book of life. If you studied under me very long, you know about the book of life where all believers' names are written and they remain written. The book of life is Daniel 12.1, Philippians 4.3, Revelation 3, 5, 13, 8, 17, 8, many times in Revelation. So these names are on the divine roster, and no creature on heaven or earth can remove them. No satanic force, no demon can remove them. Now some of you may be immediately thinking in your mind, but don't you teach that people can lose their faith and then their salvation? Yes, I do. We're not talking about a person's own choice in losing his faith here. We're talking about outside forces. So we need to understand the difference. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. And if one decides to go against God and goes into apostasy and rebellion against God and no longer believes, he therefore forfeits not only being a believer, but his salvation. A lot of scriptures teach that. We've come across many in our studies over the years. Verse 21 speaks in part of the privileges these disciples have. Verse 21. It's a long verse. In that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. This is Jesus. He rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. In the same hour, he, that's Jesus, rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and the power of the Spirit. And he said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. Notice he uses the word Lord himself, the word for master, sovereign over heaven and earth possessor or owner of heaven and earth. So Jesus here is thanking the Father, the sovereign Lord, for something he has done. That you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding. Now, 
The wise and understanding are those of the world. Those of the world who think they know the ways of the world when in fact they do not know at all. They don't know them at all. God will destroy this wisdom in the future, 1 Corinthians 1.19. The world's philosophers, the human viewpoint, the human centeredness on so much of this thinking is not only off, it's way off. This kind of saying is what we're reading here about them not really having this knowledge, whether it's hidden to them. That's a real stick in their eye especially the Judaizers who thought their knowledge and wisdom would earn their way to heaven. Now they're being told that that wisdom really amounts to nothing. But who gets the information? Who gets the truth on this matter? I translated little children, but this word also includes babies. Nephios is the word nephios. It's the word for a small child. I use little children. I say little children. I mean little children. I mean infants, innocent, maybe can't even walk yet. This is the most innocent, but yet ignorant. By that I mean uninformed. And also those in the most need of care. So the contrast here is between these Weisenheimers and infants. The educated and religious types who think they know so much do not receive the divine message, whereas the innocent, uninformed, dependent types do. It is the humble who recognize their need for God, not yet completely spoiled by the world, but they are still open to God in the gospel. And then he closes this verse with this last line. Let me get the verse up there for you. For such was your gracious will. This is God's plan. This is the way God wanted it to work out. Literally it says, For thus was well pleasing before you. The idea is for to do thus was well pleasing before you. So this was God's way of working things out. This is what Jesus is rejoicing about. It's not those who think they know it all and don't need anyone that receive the message. It's those who don't know anything and need help and they know it. Now these disciples who have decided to follow Jesus learn to depend on him for their ministry. That too makes Jesus happy. It's these disciples who have become the babies and have shown themselves to be mature in their ministry. So Jesus is praising the Father for this plan. It's a wonderful plan. All these disciples come back and report to Jesus what they've experienced and their obedience to Jesus, utilizing that power. They're full of joy and excited. So Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. So Jesus is sharing in the joy of the success of this ministry. One might say success, but there were whole towns that rejected him. Now, you define success in terms of doing God's will. People have their choices to whether they want to believe in Christ or not, to believe the message. So here both Jesus and the disciples are emotionally filled with happiness over the way God is doing this. Remember this the next time you get down or depressed in ministry. 
Jesus is thrilled to give to you his authority. And he's done that in the fact that you've been told he'll be with you when you go out and you minister. You have his power to accomplish the plan of the Father. Demonstrated while Jesus was on earth with these 72 disciples. If they did it, you can do it. You have the same Holy Spirit. You have Jesus supervising from on high. So this was God's plan in those days. The strategy of the Son in his ministry and now that of the disciples to follow in a similar way. Then these disciples make disciples contributing to more laborers in the field for the harvest. And that continues the generations up to you. We have many reasons to praise God. And remember, this is for you too. You too will have the opposition, the hardships, the stress of circumstances and people. You say, but we don't have those miraculous powers like they did. Well, first of all, let me answer that in two ways. Yes, you do. And no, you don't need those particular gifts. You don't have to have those gifts because you don't need them. First of all, it's not God's plan. And secondly, God wants you to depend on him for all those things. He'll protect you from the hostility of nature as he sees fit, as well as people and Satan and his forces. Being turned down more times than one can count. Now, disciples had experienced this too, but they're thrilled to do God's work. Right in the midst of the cosmos diabolicus. And the son shared that joy with them. Verse 22 is a theologically loaded voice, uh, excuse me, loaded verse. Now, if you've studied the, John, uh, the Gospel of John with me, uh, you might think this is right out of John because these things should be familiar. Luke 10, 22. All things have been given over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the, Father, who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. I read that kind of fast. We'll go over it slowly. But doesn't this sound like it's right out of John, if you study John with me? John spends a lot of time on this subject, about the relationship between the Father and the Son, and then he brings in believers, and how we're all connected. It begins by saying, All things have been given over to me by my Father. God the Father's plan included giving everything over to the Son as the plan unfolds. Showing that the Father and the Son are in total agreement and alignment and carrying out the plan. Use a couple of verses in John about this time. John 10, 15, 17, 2. John 10, 15, 17, 2. The all things include both revelation of the plan and power. Jesus knows it perfectly and carries it out perfectly. Now we see more of the rest of all things in the remainder of this verse. Notice, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father. Now understand that. Now, we've studied general revelation, natural revelation. People can become aware of God, his existence, creation, and something of his power through general revelation. But if you're going to know God beyond that, you've got to know the Son. And no one knows who the Son is except the Father. So what we need to do is Learn something about the Son, and then we'll learn about the Father. Only God the Father knows the Son intimately 
in his entirety. And he reveals to us about his son through his word. The verse continues, or who the father is except the son. So here we see what we call mutual knowledge. Divine mutual knowledge. The father and the son know each other not only as father and a son would, but far more. So in that they are one as God. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him, that's back in our verse, the last line. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Don't miss that one. Because that would include you. Here we see the sovereignty as the Son chooses to reveal the Father to certain people. Even in this, there is mutual knowledge and agreement between the Father and the Son. And this tells us that if you really want to know about the Father, then you must listen to the Son. It was his mission to reveal the Father to the human race. He did so. And also remember, speaking of Jesus... It is his word, his works, his disciples, his instruction, his authority, his delegated, his delegated power that reveals God the Father to the human race. All in perfect alignment with the Father's will. Now this is one of those major points we could spend a lot of time on. But I want you to understand, it's summed up in this verse beautifully. All things have been given over to me by my Father. That's Jesus speaking. He now has the authority and the power and everything. He's the God-man now. He can, he's in a position now where he can relate to human, humans like never before. Because he is human. He goes on to say, And no one knows who the Son is except the Father. So it's God who really knows me. But then he goes on and say, And who the Father is except the Son. And I'm the one who really knows the Father. This is just beautiful. This is just perfection. Uh, I just say perfection in, in, in communication of God's theology of himself and relationship between the Father and the Son. But then it opens up the end of this. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him, that's where we come in. God the Father and God the Son have the plan that they're going to reveal each other to you. And that's a matter of your choice. You open up to God and He will choose to reveal both the Father and the Son to you. All these lines reveal to us how the Father and the Son are related in the most intimate and mutual of ways that we can possibly understand, that we can comprehend. For us, we know God the Father. We know God because of Jesus Christ. He is the one who revealed the Father. Only in a limited way can we completely know Him. We begin with general and natural revelation. Takes us to God. Then man comes to earth and reveals God as He wants to be revealed. Let me just kind of sketch this out for a moment. We have God, the Creator. For now, we'll call him God the Father. All right, put the slash. We have man. How does God the Father communicate to man? First, through general revelation. Man can look up at the stars and say, where'd that come from? Something must have made it. Something can't come from nothing. 
Okay, so they become awareness of there's a God. Let's just write it like this, kind of small. But how do you know more about God the Father? He sends someone who can talk to you, who can write words you can understand, who can speak words you can understand. I should say speak. Jesus didn't write anything, but his disciples did. So he comes as the God-man, Jesus Christ. He communicates to his disciples. His disciples write his word. He gives us his power. And now we learn more about God so that he becomes much bigger in our life the same time we learn about Jesus Christ it's a perfect plan something to rejoice about now Jesus here is described as truly special in his connection to God the Father and how he reveals the Father to man those who are his children says something about your attitude who have turned from the world to God through Christ you know when I look now at the world and the powers and the politics and the you know, dangers out there from whatever you want to call it all the threats of nations and uh, natural disasters as people call them it's nice to be the child of the Creator. Knowing that He's going to take care of you. He's going to watch over you. And that your best friend, you could say, or your brother is Christ. Put it that way. You share with Him as being a child of God. He's the Son of the Son of God. You're a Son of God. Part of that privilege is being under His care. Verse 23 gives us a reason the disciples are blessed. When he says, then turning to the disciples, he said privately, blessed are the eyes that see what you see. Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. Seeing here includes experience. What the disciples have seen and experienced with Jesus is a blessing that few experienced. They are truly blessed. And that they can share in that ministry as well as be under Jesus' personal direction. But even greater is that they were able to go out and do God's work, now listen, without God's personal, excuse me, without Jesus' personal supervision. He wasn't there with them. They were able to go out on their own by twos and still work with God's power and do those great works. The ones that John 14, 12 records about. The greater works. And this is a time in which we live now, began by Jesus, carried on by the disciples up to our time, that many Old Testament saints would have loved to have seen and experienced. Verse 24. For I tell you, this is Jesus speaking, that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. You see, the prophets and kings only saw glimpses of the future age when these things would happen, that is, the kingdom of God. They got glimpses into phase one, two, and three, not always being able to sort it out. They didn't have the information. But they saw through revelation themselves, either through uh, themselves or from another person for whom God revealed it and communicated to them something of the future an exciting times that they're not going to get to be there for Hebrews eleven thirteen. listen to this all these people talking about the Old Testament greats in fact were still living by faith when they died they did not receive the things promised they only saw them and welcomed them from a distance that's how real they were they went it's okay we got them coming and they admitted that they were 
aliens and strangers on earth. That's a conclusion they drew. This is not my home. So they saw the future through the eyes of faith. It was a very real to them, so much so that they welcomed them from a distance. And then we got to look at 1 Peter, 1 Peter 1.10 and following. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. Kind of like people who study prophecy today. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you. When they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. These things are so great. They were so anticipated. The things you're experiencing right now. The age in which you live. The power that you have. The ministry that you have. The privilege that you have. Now what we must see here, and this is very important, is what I just mentioned, the privilege. We live in an age of privilege. We are given the privilege of doing what these disciples did. To tell of Jesus, to reveal God, to do this in the power of God, following God's lead living obedient but yet challenging lives, facing the opposition, the elements, nature, the hardships, yet doing all this for the high cause there is, the highest cause there is, to call and prepare others to do what we do, go in the field as harvesters. Let's just quickly go over the verses we've studied today in our translation. We begin at 12. I tell you it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. More to you, Chorazin. More to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you, which they were not, had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, setting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable in the judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you not? Will you be exalted to heaven? No. You shall be brought down to Hades. The one who hears you, hears me. And the one who rejects you, rejects me. And the one who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. In that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All, thi all things have been given over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the, Father, who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then turning to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the ones that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. Let's pray. Well, Father, again, we thank you for your word. This has been a lesson with so much to learn, so much depth. And we realize what privilege we have now to serve you. Father, give us the strength, the wisdom, the power we need to carry on the mission. 
to give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.